Hi, Cara. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to hear us talk uh, for what I hope will be a really interesting conversation between Cara and I and between you guys when we're done. Um, if there are pressing questions or comments while we're talking, feel free to ask them. But I, we're going to try and reserve questions for after the talk, if possible. Um, introductions? Introductions. Should I introduce myself. Tell us about yourself. So, my name is Amber Seva. I'm the assistant curator at the ICA. Um, I have been here in Richmond for about a year and a half now. I went to undergrad here in art history and went to Bard College um, at the Center of Curatorial Studies for my master's program and has been, have been working, I've been working as a curator for um, about eight and a half years in and out of galleries uh, as an independent curator um, and now um, doing a little bit of classroom work um, thanks to VCU Arts and specifically <laughs> painting and printmaking and Kendall Budster. So um, I've had really great interactions with a lot of you which has been incredible. Uh, what else to say? I think that's the gist of it. You'll learn a lot about um, the way I think about curating and the way I interact with artists in this talk. Um, you want to do a little introduction? Yeah, yeah. So um, my name is Cara Benedetto, and I teach in painting and printmaking. Um, and uh, I moved here from New York, and before that, Wisconsin. And you know, my mom is here visiting. And uh, I feel um, pretty strongly about the topic that we're speaking on tonight, um, specifically because I think that um, schools uh, are the place to um, destabilize uh, notions of gender. And um, uh, because it's a, a trap in a way, and hopefully we'll unpack that a little bit tonight. Um, but I also am interested in how an artist can have an antagonistic role to institutions um, and what that looks like and how um, conversations and difference can be um, talked about in a productive way. Um, so I'm just going to jump into, uh, you know, and also, I mean, this is important. We're, we're talking about um, this particular exhibition, right? It's, um, and it's not to alienate anyone who hasn't seen it, um, but to talk through some of the, the key framing devices on um, how uh, institutions frame differences and um, as an exhibitionary practice um, and the ways in which artists can navigate um, that structure. Right. So the exhibition. Oh, so okay. before a little bit before we get into the specific exhibition that we're talking through, um, we'll talk a bit about um, the title of this talk, which is "Room for Now," um, which we came up with before <laughs> thinking that we would talk through this exhibition trigger, um, and then reading through the catalog and having conversations about the exhibition we learn that one of the key ideas behind the exhibition is this idea of disidentification. Um, uh, the quote is up here, but essentially it's just institutions and pedagogical structures making room where room was not made for individuals and concepts. Um, so the exhibition that we're talking about is Trigger, Gender as a Tool and a Weapon, which was up at the New Museum for a few months, uh, starting in what, December? Mm -hmm. January just came down. Um, it has 40 artists. All 40 artists were, are dealing with some slippery notion of gender. So that meaning that um, the, it, the exhibition doesn't um, assign itself to deal with gender as a binary, but gender as a performative action that slips in and out of um, um, ideas of uh, identity and slips in and out of ideas of race and class and uh, socioeconomic status. And so the list of the artists is uh, quite vague, I uh, vague, vast, um, mostly US based. Um, and we'll talk a bit about that. There are some artists that aren't specifically US artists, but um, ideas of gender, um, sexuality, and race are very much embedded in an American experience in this show. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So to give you a little bit of an idea of how um, it was organized, um, it was curated by Joanna Burton, um, and the exhibition is, um, it was produced by, she's a, a deeply academic curator, um, and um, the, the entire exhibition um, was produced with a pedagogical frame. So um, a lot of the, the access points are through the, the exhibition materials, so like the catalog and the essays, the writing, the conversations around the exhibition, um, and so what we're going to talk about is some of the things of like what's, what's missing in the exhibition, um, what the catalog is saying that the exhibition is not saying. Um, and one of those things is kind of a key contingency um, that's um, articulated in the curatorial statement um, that talks about, um, well, maybe you want to talk about the history of, the cura of this. Yeah, yeah. So, um, as Kara said, the exhibition is deeply academic and pedagogical. And one of the things that is at once lacking in the exhibition in itself, but makes up for in the catalog, is the situation in which um, Johanna Burton finds herself in as a curator who has been deeply invested in identity politics from the 80s and 90s um, around the quote unquote culture wars around issues of race, uh, gun control, abortion, um, and gender. And so what she does in the catalog, which she does not do a lot in the show, is she sets up the moment in history and defines our particular moment as one different than the one she came from in the 80s and 90s, in which identity politics were very much a, a, a means to a conversation and an end to a conversation. Um, and she talks about now um, that we're in a really different place. So in the 80s and 90s, the way that we were talking about culture wars, we were thinking about the left and the right. And so in this essay, she, she says, um, I won't quote her, quote her exact words, but she essentially says that now we're at this problem where there's a sincere incompatibility. The right has advanced itself, and the left, left is deeply fractured. On one side, there are a group of people that um, are allies to uh, minority groups, and on the other side, there are those who actually belong to those minority groups. And there's a lot of contention between the two. One is that feels exploited and used um, by the other side who um, uses uh, minority or disenfranchisement as something to portray their social goodness. Um, and so Johanna is really smart in the way she sets that up in the beginning. Um, and she really makes it clear how different the issue of identity politics is now. Um, and at the end of the essay, she talks about how stating your own identity is how, the moment at which a conversation ends now, right? Like we have very many platforms. We have so many ways of speaking about who we are and what we believe in. But that tends to be that moment where we state our politics and we are unable to enter into a productive conversation because we are so identified with a certain group or issues associated with that group. So she proposes that the exhibition, in a way, um, is trying to get past that communication barrier and past the idea of this 80s and 90s moment of identity politics. That's, that was great. Thank you. Um, and, and so to move beyond this stalemate, right, which is um, how she uh, references um, this incompatibility, um, is in the essay, it's sort of articulated through dialogue um, and productive negotiations. And gender is the tool in which to do that. So um, to this end, gender is being used as a transactional sign to be trafficked among players who deploy it for certain ends. And so, uh, as Amber said, the proposition of the show is to produce an exhibition that approaches gender not as a subject, um, but rather an interest in plumbing what Sedgwick calls being gender-y. Um, so here we have, nice, yeah, all right, that's good, helpful. Um, what is gender-y? It's a tendency that can manifest as valences or thresholds in people as well as objects. And what does that mean? Um, it points to the instability of gender. Um, 
If gender is seen as an act one does rather than a thing one is, gender or a performance of gender cannot be structuralized or even understood through the lens of codified identity politics. The frustration one might have with these non-definition stops one from grasping, shape-shifting, essentially ungraspable ideas. So um, this is where language becomes really important um, in the premise of the show. and. Um, and this is where some of the issues come up um, in terms of how I read the show and where it succeeds and doesn't succeed. But before we get there, um, do you want to talk about Sedgwick's ungraspable? Stuff? Yeah. Um, so she, she sets up uh, Eve Sedgwick's idea of the ungraspable nature of gender, meaning that gender is so performative that one cannot be codified in an identity that can be located within an action or a way of making. And so this is a really strong point that comes out of theory, but it's also somewhat of a cop-out in the exhibition to the moments in which the things that she portrays, she portrays, she's curated with objects are ungraspable. So there's this kind of flattening out of history, per se, when different ideas of queering, different ideas of uh, gender politics are not being situated in their proper um, moment in time, in their proper reason for being antagonistic, and an exhibition becomes completely flattened with, with works next to each other that A, don't have room to breathe, and that are coming from two totally different um, perspectives and politics. Um, so the slipperiness is a great thing to talk about when we speak language and we, when we speak performativity, but it is not so much a great thing when we think about exhibition design and the care that a curator is or, or an institution is responsible for when mounting an exhibition. Um, Which leads us to the politics of the mess. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, one of the things that the, the essay does that, one of the essays, there's many essays in this catalog, it's, it's pretty big and it has like a full description of each practice, um, a little bit of the history of the practice and um, a bit of the, the legacy of the institution, the new museum, um, and the shows that came before this. So they've been dealing with gender politics and identity politics for a really long time. So um, this is kind of this penultimate moment in the institution in which they bring contemporary moments to feed into this history that they've been really, really track trying to tackle some ways successfully in other ways not so much for um, um, some time now. So in the beginning of the essay, Fred Moten has this really incredible uh, quote about the politics of the mess. And I'll just read it because he's too good to butcher. Um, so he says, Revolution and anti-colonialism, as um, per Fanon, is a program of total disorder, and museums and academic institutions are meant to clean up messes. The history of the modern subject is about cleaning up a mess. The it, it means the eradication of busyness, the eradication of fuzz, and, the politic and politics is meant to regulate this mess. And then he asks, what if museums choose to present rather than clean up these messes? What might that look like? Um, so that brings us back to this, the notion of the curator, right? So this curator is a deeply academic curator who has basically taken these sometimes, um, they're all multifaceted, but these sometimes edgy, and messy practices and have put them in these highly academic institutional lenses um, that have, in a way, eradicated what Fred Moten is called for. So then the show in itself answers its own question. It's, I think that the problem is that institutions aren't capable so far of presenting mess because their role in this entire interaction is to present a clean, uh, respectable, uh, academic, um, version of these artist projects. You guys um, know where the mess is, right? What? You guys know where the mess is, right? <laughs> I mean, we know where the mess is, right? Like, met, there are so many artists here, and the way that we think through things is sometimes uh, not linear, right? Yep. And so, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to like. No, go, go ahead. <laughs> but just thinking through like these notions of, um, or, the aesthetics of mess and like how we get there and how 
Joanna Burton in the curatorial essay talks a lot about play and the importance of play and, um, and how I sort of think about the mess and strategies of play in like a, a non-productive way or non-product driven way. And so um, thinking about, um, you know, like no end result um, as a way of thinking about an exhibition is uh, difficult when the exhibition is full of objects. Um, okay, so where are we now? I love this. Oh, here. Oh, yeah, the mess. So we can talk about how it's not messy enough is my well. Issue. It's messy in ways and not messy enough in other ways. Yeah. But um, so in the loss of some of these messy aspects of, artist, of these artistic practices, what has happened in this particular installation? So there's um, basically what you're looking at is on the left side, the left hand side is the reverse view of the same room. So the back of the screen is a shattered glass. The front of this screen is um, a film by Raina Gossett, which you see on this side. Um, so, the works being displayed in this room come from really different political views and different identities when it comes to queering. So, in front of Raina Gossett, which is it's these little um, uh, this carpet, this tapestry, and these small um, paintings um, are made by Ulrika Mueller, which is an, who is an incredibly academic, queer, scholarly artist next to a film by a trans activist, uh, Raina Gossett, right? And the way in which the essay talks about these works, does some, I mean, it's kind in a way that it tells you a bit from where these two practices are coming from, but within the exhibition, it doesn't situate the way in which Ulrika's social uh, position obliterates Raina Gossett and um, as a trans black woman advocating for um, the survival of trans black women who are continuously killed. And so there's this flattening out of history because A, there's not enough space for the rooms to, to, for the pieces to breathe, and there's not enough contextualization within the exhibition for where each of these pieces are coming from. It's kind of like this age old thing that we've done with like um, shows about AIDS, uh, the AIDS crisis in which uh, Felix Gonzalez Torres are put next to ACT UP, right? Felix Gonzalez Torres was doing work for the gallery. He was doing AIDS activism for the gallery. ACT UP was on the ground helping people in a real way. Mm -hmm. And if one doesn't contextualize that properly in an exhibition, you're not giving the kind of care that um, an institution and a curator might want to give to what needs to give to a work of art in order to give the audience the proper amount of information to know where these practices are situated in. Mm -hmm. Which sort of brings us back to like the New York City centric mode of curating this show and how um, the social mess is contingent on that as like an art center mm -hmm. um, where you know we know there's many art centers. Um, Trauma. Do you want to talk a bit about, you had some really good points about the, this idea of um, this sort of social economy that's compiled in this show with the types of artists that um, have been cho chosen, the fact that how identifiable they are, how much social uh, weight they pull, um, and how much room was actually made in the show for artists that maybe might not be that well known or um, not, might not have this kind of social pull that most of these artists in the show have. Yeah, I mean, there are artists in this show that um, appear in a way in it, within this institutional context that have been avoiding um, the institutional context for quite some time. So um, Ginger Brooks Takahashi is not actually listed in the show but appears in one of the films and um, is sort of doing like a, um, a, a real life uh, role play. Um, and I read it as kind of like a brilliant um, uh, intervention in the show in several ways. Um, but I mean, just very generally, um, how the artists, like there's so many painters and object makers and thinking through, um, like where is the rigorous performance um, in a show about performativity? Your, yeah, I mean it's kind of basic, or I don't know. Maybe I'm 
missing something here, but um, it feels like um, th if the element of time and the element of now and these questions of activism um, within dialogue are so prescient, where's the syllabus? You know, like, um, why isn't that structured into a show like this um, in this way? But am I? No, yeah, we're talking about yeah. the nail on the head. Um, and then also with that, that said, there are a lot of younger artists, and I've talked a little bit about this with um, Liang and Dahlia, but um, a couple of grad students in the painting and printmaking program, but thinking about um, uh, what, is, what is the ethics of commitment here in terms of how is the curator situating these artists, these young artists, um, like, you know, now that they're blowing up, like, um, who, where is the care being given to um, uh, how an art artistic practice is sustained and maintained um, when it's it's a that's a lot of pressure to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, so that objectification happening on top of kind of um, the the lack of performance based works. Um, should we? Uh, so you want to show? So we're going to show. So I'm going to back up a bit yeah. with the conversation with trauma, um, and it's um, based on a lot of conversations that I've I've had with students about the the choice of using the word trigger as an exhibition title, right? Um, trigger as being something that can be um, deeply harmful physically to someone um, uh, and or to a group of people. Um, and the way that trigger is being talked about in the exhibition as a tool through language um, that is being, that I think is being really, tackled really well in works, but in framing device, not properly, um, there's not enough accountability for the, the, how far the idea of triggering, triggering can be physically to groups of individuals, to people and or individuals. Um, and it's just being played with as a rhetorical device for um, stretching uh, a gender binary or a kind of non-conforming, somewhat institutional critique um, that these artists are doing. But there are two particular works in the show, one of that I'll talk about, and, and then um, Cara will talk about the second one, that deal with trauma, bodily trauma in a real, real way um, that um, I think that are kind of, for, for maybe us, uh, people can have different opinions, but mm -hmm. cornerstones for the show, um, mm -hmm. and it happens to be through moving image. So the first film that we'll show, um, and we'll just show clips, they're both pretty long, um, is by Patrick Staff. Um, it's called Weed Killer. Um, and so the, the film, um, Patrick Staff is an artist that deals a lot with um, experimental career biography, biographies, but he does it in a, um, a kind of documentary style. The piece takes its name after a Catherine Lord um, uh, story called The Summer of Baldness, in which um, uh, uh, the main protagonist is dealing with, um, or dealing with, battling breast cancer for quite some time, and through this um, develops this um, uh, uh, alternate identity or persona that she calls her baldness. Um, the the uh, film is being, uh, or this story is being talked through by a trans artist um, who speaks about the um, connection, the physical connection between one going through a transition and one going through chemotherapy. Um, uh, they talk a lot about um, the idea, the, the physical pain that one goes through as it uh, feeling like mainlining weed killer. Um, and so there's a slippage in the, in the film that goes back between this kind of uh, pharma, um, pharma trauma from a uh, cancer patient perspective and a uh, medical trauma from a, 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 a trans person that is um, transitioning. Oh. And, okay. Oops. Sorry. Okay, and this one, the other one is straight from the artist's website, and this one admittedly is a bit of a bootleg because I shot it on my cell phone while I was watching the show. I don't, it's not something I would uh, champion, but I just wanted to be able to show this film to people, so. 
don't do that again. stop it here so we have room for the other video. Okay. Alright, so this the piece goes on for about 35 minutes and it goes it goes through both the progression of the main character's transition and speaks through this um, Catherine Lord's character's um, battle with breast cancer. 
Um, and it pushes, the film goes very far into talking about ways in which, or the, the, the means for which people, one goes to feel comfortable with themselves, uh, and also how far one goes to self-fashion themselves to fit into a certain kind of um, a demographic or um, social position. Um, and, and I sat in this film maybe two rounds of this 36 minute film and watching people come in and out, it seemed like there was this moment in which so many of us have dealt with uh, family members, friends, or, or someone who's dealt with cancer. That's like a relatable um, concept and struggle that's, that everyone can, can, can talk through and understand. Um, and listening to people see that connection between um, the death of someone because of can cancer and that connection to a trans experience was a real access point, I think, for people that maybe otherwise wouldn't be open to thinking about the transition and how that, that works physically and how demanding that is physically. And, it's re and it became really interesting at the end of the film, film, not only watching the film, but watching people interact with the film to think about the difference between recovery, the, the, I guess the, the, the so no, sorry, the, the, what someone goes through while they're recovering versus what someone goes through before they're dying, right? And how slippery that, 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 that journey might be, right, towards, um, Recovering could turn to one way, right? Recovering can turn to death. Recovering can turn to a full recovery, right? And it's that kind of precarious um, nature of recovery, being in the middle of two, two worlds, dead and alive, mm -hmm. um, that was really successful in the film and really opened this idea of um, gender, bodily gender, mm -hmm. um, in a way that was super accessible, I think, for a lot of people, and, and rigorous, rigorous mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a, um, a review by Joanna Fateman from La Tigra, who's um, talking about how she wanted to be triggered more when she was at the show, um, and, and she basically said it was because of the lack of um, performance-based works and then kind of cited performative works that, that did sort of do exactly what you're talking about, which I did feel in this um, room and in this space, because it was like an, a real affective of, of like, you know, it's, it, ha it holds confrontation. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, the, the face is large, it's, it's fully frontal, it's, you're watching people go in and out, and I, I recall that yeah. feeling. And watching real physical, collapses, right? Like the, the, the physical yellowing of the whites of your eyes or the collapsing of veins and it going in and out of this kind of um, uh, weird reverse cinematic lens was like jarring and beautiful and, and, and ultimately really troubling, um, um, but effective as a film. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, maybe we can talk about, go watch, Stanya's piece yeah, because she's Stanya. doing a lot of things, but like so differently. We'll watch Stanya and then we'll and then we'll talk about Stanya. Did did you guys go to this show? Oh yeah, who did in this any, room saw this show? Raise your hand. Did I? No, oh, I have to. Remember. Okay. How are we doing so far? I think it's off. Terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll, I can stop it. It's not right.
Yeah, I guess so. that's good. Thank you. Ah. Thanks. No, oh, that's why. Are the mics back on? Is your mic on? Uh, yeah. I broke. I broke my mic. <laughs> Can I use your mic for a second? Yeah. Thanks. Um, so uh, we don't know, like what's wrong with the character. We don't know what happened to the character. This is, this is the entry point um, that we get. And um, it's basically, you know, kind of like playing off of um, bro, uh, like a charming bro, uh, a privileged subject um, in combination with a torn, bleeding, um, kind of ridiculous uh, character. And I think this conflation is really important 
to how we think through the humor involved. Um, because who laughed? I, sh I show it to my classes all the time, sometimes just when I'm taking attendance, and I just play it because I love it so much, and, uh, and no one laughs. <laughs> and and I and it's I think it's like this it's a very interesting kind of ethical question of um, who like who wants to laugh and why and um, there's this great Judith Butler um, quote that um, it's uh, laughter oh wait no sorry the loss of the sense of the normal can be its own occasion for laughter especially when the normal the original is revealed to be a copy and an inevitably failed one, an ideal that no one can embody. In this sense, laughter emerges in the realization that all along the original was derived. So thinking about this gender E effect um, and this destabilized, oh, five minutes left, okay. Um, no, that's good, thank you. Um, the gender -y effect, the destabilization of the subject, and trying to like to understand um, an affect, like an affective response to a, a piece of work that like is basically it's a broken body, you know. And thinking about um, what is a broken subject in relation to a privileged subject, and how do those two things kind of like um, push up against one another and create like tension, release. Uh, laughter and so Sonia Khan I think is like within the joke format is really brilliant because no one laughs. Well because and it's so, a joke and it's horror too. No? Right exactly yeah it's like the, ten, the tension the tendential <laughs> laughter what Freud calls you know like right up to the point of laughter but not quite and I think that's like an important feeling that we have that I have now is like you know on stage or whatever it's like ah it feels weird it's like you know what I mean? Well, that's depending on how you read the film, right? Because if you yeah. read the film, it's like, so if you watch the whole film, it's like 30, 37 minutes long, and there's so many uh, excuses as to why this person is bandaged, right? She's like, yeah. I fell in a ditch. I got bit by a shark. It's a really bad sunburn, or I'm just trying to get hot. <laughs> like, those are, those are some of the reasons. So you're not sure if the subject, if you read the subject as someone who is uh, coming out of a, well, both traumatic, but coming out of a traumatic situation in which they've been hurt and they're bandaged and recovering, you read this film as a different thing and it's harder to laugh at it. Versus if this person is coming out of plastic surgery and just being like, I don't know, a total idiot at half of the film, <laughs> like, you have more of an allowance to laugh, no? Yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. there is a really complicated um, ways in which, you have, like you said, affect is being um, brought up in this film that are, um, important uh, uh, and somewhat accessible, but through laughter and somewhat through horror, right? Like, because yeah. you're yeah. horrified if you're laughing at the wrong part and you gotta look around to make sure that you're not doing the wrong thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and this is an image of the way that the, show, the piece was installed. So there was two other, I mean, I guess, inconsequential-ish videos and a lot of tchotchkes um, on this monitor that was said to look like a living room. Um, um, yeah, I, do you want to finish that thought? No, no, that's, the, I just was trying to yeah. situate the image. The, I actually, um, I had such a problem with this installation, I didn't understand why the objects were present, and the video was so strong, and, um, and then this kind of setup, living room setup or whatever, but I actually like emailed Stani Khan, a creepy fan email today, because I was like, I love your video. <laughs> and my friend Amber and I are gonna talk about it at VCU. <laughs> and I should have been like, but those objects, like why, <laughs> what? I mean, I can guess maybe. Yeah, please. It could be that the film, this particular film was made in 2010. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, and the institution needed to show a new work, so they added mm -hmm. stuff mm -hmm. to make mm -hmm. it into an installation uh, in 2017. Uh, so that's an option. Um, uh, yeah, so we don't have, we can't talk about anything else. Wait, um, but we have this, you want to read this, I don't know. The closing quote? I don't know that Our, it's that important. It doesn't matter. We should do questions. Oh yeah, questions, absolutely, questions, most important. I think Sorry, Mark has a question. Sorry. Kind of. Yeah. Uh, I forget the two artists you were talking about, but you were, 
um, you showed us an installation view of one room and there was one um, black trans a um, artist yeah. and yeah. one very academic lesbian. And, and like A.K. Burns. I'm sorry? And A.K. Burns and yeah. A.K. Burns. Uh, and who was the other? Uh, so A.K. Burns, Curtis Talway, Santiago, Tiago, which is um, uh, these kinds of uh, masks behind the screen. Uh, Diamond Stingley, which is the kind of uh, braided piece going down the wall. Um, A.K. Burns, A.L. Steiner here. Okay. And I think that's everyone in that room. And your criticism is that it faces like, very important differences. My criticism is that it doesn't expand on those very important differences, and it doesn't situate the artist within those historical moments in which those differences were um, important or necessary I, for a reading of their work. What would you propose as an alternative? Because I think this as an essential problem in every group show yeah. and, and see. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know, as soon as you're sharing a space with other artists, um, oftentimes I can't even figure out why, you know, I, right. I'm in the same space. Right. Um, but mm -hmm. aside from um, expounding through wall text or catalog or preserving um, a certain you know, spatial integrity, giving everybody their own gallery room, what do you propose aside from just showing very similar artists next? I mean, I, I don't know what the alternative is in a group show. I mean, I think the alternative is it for the institution who brought in the work and who brought in the artist to do the artist's service by explaining to the viewer what this artist is, the artist's work and practice is situated in. So, um, so giving an artist their own room is not possible, right? This would have been a four-person sure, show, sure, exactly. and it's a 40-person show. But that was nowhere? Yeah, like, no, it was honestly. barely in the catalog not in the exhibition. So that's another thing. It's like, it presumes that one has the time to read the doorstopper of a catalog, which is very good, but not present in the show. Well, it seems to be a general problem of group shows. Yes. It's more about the curator than about the individual arts. At times. At times. Which is interesting with this particular show, right? Because Johanna is calling for like, a ceasefire on identity pol politics and individuality. She's saying, hey, we're, we're never going to be able to talk to each other if we keep kind of beating our drums about our own identity. We won't get past these differences, these major uh, stating our differences. There's a mean to an end to, to when it comes to a conversation, right? Um, but stating the differences of an artistic practice as an exhibition is very different than the inability between two people or two communities to talk to one another because they're too busy wrapped up in their own identity politics. So I think maybe that if one is kind in this reading, can say that she was trying to do a more collective um, exhibition practice in which these artists were shown less as individuals and more as a group of people addressing similar or similar slippery topics. Um, but that's very generous to say, um, and a stretch. Yeah. I mean, I also think that the group show is a problem, like in general, and thematic shows are problematic because like what is, what is, like they are of market concern often, right? To pigeonhole, to pin down, to like, to, to extrapolate on community or ideas of, of um, collective working. But like, you know, if one of the, the focuses is about, I guess the question is, what is opening up and what is shutting down and how are how are these differences being articulated um, if you don't have the catalog or if you don't have so it's it's about access points and you know um it's i i like one of the big problems i have with the show in general is that it's so art centric or like you know like i mean really yes bad. objects but like why so many artists well, I mean, yeah, it, I mean, it's a good question to ask. Right. There's certainly a benefit in an institution dealing with such an important topic and allowing the public to see so much good work at one time, mm -hmm. right? But yeah. where is the line in which the work no longer gets served properly, right? right? Like some of, you know, I, you know, people that have been 
following gender politics when it, with respect to art probably came to the show and were so excited to be able to see works by Sharon Hayes, to see works by Raina Gossett, to see works all at once. Like that's a yeah, huge yeah. privilege yeah. Um, to be able to do oh, that. Um, yeah. 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 So I don't, we didn't really give you a solution because it's difficult and it's problematic. <laughs> so <laughs> it's gendery. Yeah. We agree. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I think um, it becomes an attractive, I also agree about group shows, mm -hmm. um, but with, a, with an issue like a, a collection show mm -hmm. or even a biennial, you know, it, it becomes a problem to solve. Mm -hmm. um, and I yeah. think contextualizing it, like in, in the museum, the Rana Sophia, they have like really long academic wall text and instead of putting act up next to Felix Gonzalez Torres, it's act up next to the Gorilla Girls right. and certain kinds of aesthetic strategies. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so it's a, a, it's a much more dialectical approach mm. than thematic. Right. Mm -hmm. Did you have a question, Andy? I have a question, actually really similar to your question, Um, it's a really good question. Um, I think a starting point would be, I think that a lot of times us curators and institutions are, um, can easily fall into the trap of thematics, meaning, okay, there's a particular moment in time um, right now, you know, gender, gender politics are really important to people, so let's do a show about gender. What artists are dealing with gender? And then you're kind of, picking artists that are dealing with a certain thematic and putting them together, right? Which is to me very different than, I've just done 30 studio visits and 19 of those artists are dealing with ideas of gender, maybe a associated or completely not linked to who they are and where they're coming from and, and building a show around those deep conversations that are being had with artists, right? Like that's, that to me is different than slapping together a thematic show in which artists are kind of doing one thing but not fully doing this in their whole practice. Like, so an artist can be, you can be a queer artist who has works that deal with queer identity but other works in your practice do not. So being thrown in as a queer artist in a queer show without explaining the moments in which your practice doesn't do that is generalizing the artist and flattening the practice to a brand, right, to something that's sellable as an identity or a thematic in an exhibition, which is attractive to people, um, uh, but problematic to the artist. Um, so one strategy would be start, starting with the artist and starting with the work and knowing the history of their work, right? And a lot of artists, you know, like, my experience a lot with working with artists uh, within the MFA complex and also working with artists in the gallery, right, the gallery world, which, which is what I was doing for a while, which is market driven, is that um, artists are under a lot of pressure, they're under a lot of debt, and they, um, they're gallerists or they hear word that, uh, like, collectors are only buying things right now that have to do with uh, uh, dog food, I'm just making shit up. Um, so they change everything that they're doing in their practice and they say, oh, actually my, my work was about this the whole time and, and here's, this work, here's this new work that really shows you how, it's, how it is, which is uh, an artist buckling to market pressures and um, a, a, a gallery and or an institution not really protecting them and saying that like, okay, this might be a hot topic right now, but your work, your larger work and the history of, the histories that you're trying to mine in your work don't particularly serve this thematic 
So uh, maybe back off of it or explore it in a way that's true to what you really want to do. Um, I don't know, I've talked too much. But. No, that was, I mean, it's a, it's a curatorial question in one sense, and it's a question for artists um, to think through um, how, uh, how to be collective, or how to think through um, who you're next to, and place, and um, the site or location of your practice, and um, how that inhabits different spaces, um, and um, how, how dissonance or dialogue can occur. And that's why I really do believe um, that these conversations are for this exact place, school. Um, this is where these conversations happen. This is like the word, you know, trigger is, um, it, it is the, in this setting that we kind of deal with not only um, like the lawsuits, but also the actual feeling of um, what's at stake when we share our work in a context with people that um, we don't know so well, but we're getting to know and, you know, trust is building, but like um, artists taking control and agency of um, who and how they're shown and um, the language around their work, um, I think is really important. Um, I, I understand it's a curatorial problem and I'm often bothered by curators um, and particularly curators who act as artists um, or talk down to artists or patronize artists and be like, you should be in this show, of course you want to be in this show. Like, why wouldn't you want to be in this show? And um, it's really insulting to think an artist doesn't know what they're doing, you know? And um, the potentialities of how they're kind of juxtaposed to other artists that, you know, if I'm in a group show or if someone asks me to be in a show, I want to know who else is in the show, you know? Like, that's really important. Um, so I think that was like a spin-off, but. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, it just made me like, like, let's think about all of this, these artists that were really successful, um, I don't know what year is it, like, really successful eight, nine years ago that were doing post-internet art, that were doing this kind of zombie formalism, and that were, like, selling out, and were really, really doing well, and were being written about, and now that the turn has gone to the social uh, uh, and to the ethical, like it's crickets for those artists. Like they put all of their practice and their money and their time and their social economy into this brand of being these cool post-internet formalist digi painters. And now there's no room for them, right? Because they, so, they, they like, whatever, I'm bad at the sayings, but they hatched all their eggs, whatever. Yeah. They hatched all their eggs at once, or whatever. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, uh, but that has to do with market, and that has to do with um, uh, people and institutions of following trends too aggressively and too quickly, um, and the market is erratic, and it falls off, and uh, ideas change. Like, who knows what we'll be dealing with in three years when it comes to exhibition practices and thematics. Um, like, will the social, um, the political, still be something that institutions are dealing with, like, is a really interesting question to ask, um, and um, a one that artists should ask themselves, too, in thinking about the longevity of their practice. Um, Curatorial token, meaning? Like putting someone in the show mm -hmm. just because you want to check off a box. Yeah, and yeah, it's, it's like, much, yeah, I was it's just. It's like much worse than just not doing it at all. Right. And like, I, I see that all the time in institutions and I think it's a bigger question than being I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a huge question, it's a good question, and it's, and it's one that, that I think honestly started, it starts from a good Thanks. place. It starts from a place of inclusion, it starts from a place of wanting to share the perspective and stories of a lot of people at once. But when editing doesn't come into play, you get this kind of, you know, what I call Noah's art curating, and everybody comes on board, 
and then there is not enough focus on it going on within uh, the practices that are, have been chosen um, uh, and how the works are, are speaking to each other as an exhibition as a whole. Um, so again, you know, I think it starts from a good place to want everyone to hear their voices, but it's also good to remember that you know, there are other times when those voices, there's a next show, right? You can put them in the next show in which their voices can be properly heard. And, um, and I think that a lot of times, again, the pressure of artists, artists are like, you know, it's like not that easy. And we're all, we, we them, are all, we're all, there's a debt. There's a lot of debt going on. Um, and so when someone says, you want to have a show at this big major institution that could potentially change all that for you, like, it's, politics go away really quickly. Mm. And criticality goes away really quickly. <laughs> and it's funny because in the essay, Johanna, oh, yeah, right. I forgot say, saying this when I was reading, is that Johanna said that this show comes out of a moment because there is no more argument-driven exhibitions and institutions anymore. That's not tr true. Um, and institutions and artists are losing their criticality, true to an extent. Um, does, the tr does Trigger answer that question? Did, did, was Trigger a truly critical, argument-driven exhibition? The essay was, absolutely. Um, but did the show culminate in the thesis mm -hmm. that the essay mm -hmm. essentially finished off on? Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but what's so, uh, what's so interesting is that an exhibition is ephemeral, mm -hmm. right? And that's kind of one of the things that's great about a space. If you mm -hmm. go back and each time you go, it changes. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. the thing that's not ephemeral here is that catalog. Right? Mm -hmm. And so what I, I wonder, 30 years from now, this exhibit actually in your mind, will it be more successful once the experience mm -hmm. of what was un an unsuccessful mm -hmm. mess mm -hmm. has sort of Actually, what I was going to say is going off of that, like the curators were very smart in trying. I think the whole point was never about dialogue between the works themselves. Mm -hmm. Even in the catalog, they are very particular to list out the new museum's history mm -hmm. with these topics. So they're trying to create history with this show. They're not trying to create a show where works are talking to each other. They're trying to like put their finger on where this topic is right now in 2017 and who are the artists that we think should be the important ones we think about in this moment. So yeah, I think that the show probably will be remembered better as time goes on. And it should be so remembered. Then, uh, it's not yeah. to say it's not. The show is, has a lot of successes and it's deeply important. Um, and its failures are causing us to have these conversations and causing me to have these conversations in every studio visit, you to have these conversations in class, that's good. Like, that's a good outcome and that's what shows should be doing. Um, I, can I interrupt? Yeah, yeah, totally. I wonder also to both of your points, um, thinking about um, where that situates the art objects and the artists then as kind of um, placeholders or um, tools, right, or props um, within a curatorial kind of program, um, and that's a bummer. Uh, no? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you just think about how much work you know about mm -hmm. that you'll never actually see, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That you'll read about, mm -hmm. that you'll mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. out there. I mean, I think our mm -hmm. in some ways the bummer would. Be when the artist agreed to be the token in mm -hmm. the curator's vision, mm -hmm. you know, it's like a double bummer, right? Double bummer. <laughs> <laughs> but are the artists, do the artists know fully the curatorial vision when they're saying yes? Like, they know that this show is going to tackle this thematic, but do they know who they're going to be next to or how they're going to be contextualized within that thematic? Usually not. Usually they say yes, because it's a good opportunity. And there's such a di like there's such a, um, an important difference or distinction between um, ephemera and contingency, right? Like the way that um, a work is contingent on a text is contingent on a relationship, like how that formulation like they can't exist without each other, and that I think is like a beautiful um, premise and structure that um, 
I, it, it's, it also kind of made me think that the catalog was an interesting contingency to the, to the show. Um, I think that was on our, like, we had pros and cons for like everything, um, but yeah. Is it then interesting to also think about the Hannah Burton being an education curator? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 But like maybe should teach more. I don't know. Uh, yeah, right? she was. Like, she did. She was the director yeah. of CCS, and I think she. I, I think shows are her strength. Yeah. Um, oh, oh, wow. Yeah, well, we got the story on that. <laughs> no, she. I also was. Uh, she came to Columbia a couple times and talked about Lee Lozano. And at the time, I was very critical of like her sort of glorifying uh, someone's dropout of the art world. Um, but at the yeah, at the same time, like I mean, I do. I have so much respect for her in being mm -hmm. able to, like, she's put all this work in this 80s and 90s moment with identity politics and certain artists that she's been so tied to for so long, mm -hmm. and to be able to do this show and say, like, you know what, identity politics is broken. Like, I've spent all my time doing this, mm -hmm. and it's totally broken, and it's mm -hmm. not getting us anywhere, um, so what next? Like, that, I have respect for her, to get out of her own academic, um, all the, what, the academic hierarchy, all of the things she's done to get herself to that point and um, um, that she's able to be critical about it and say, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, like this is a broken system that needs to be reassessed. How can we reassess it? This is gonna be messy, here's a shot. Mm -hmm. um, is, uh, is a courageous move, I think, on her end and um, respectful. True, and it's not like the university is like utopic, right? as we also know. Um, <coughs> Except we see you. Oh, it's so. time, 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 yeah, time, so, time. So thank we you. want to thank our guests. Thank for, you uh, for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.